Frost. And we are recording. Wonderful. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining us at our Little Birds Meet uh, webinar for May. This has been um, a very amazing, amazing series of, of responses. We've been sort of overwhelmed. A um, bit of housekeeping before we start. Can I ask everybody if you can to turn your cameras off? It's probably going to get a little bit distracting um, because um, Sean's going to be talking um, during, the, during the session and we want to make sure everybody's sort of concentrating on, on him. Um, you'll all be muted as well. Um, not because I don't want to hear from everybody, it's just because there is a lot, there are a lot of people in the session. Um, so if you have any questions at any time, uh, please pop them in the chat. I'm going to be keeping an eye on the chat. I'll answer anything if I can, otherwise I'll pull out um, some questions for Sean um, to answer after he's enlightened us all with his amazing knowledge. Um, I also, before we hear from Sean, want to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands on which everybody is joining from us from tonight. Uh, so I'm calling in from Darawal country where it was pretty brisk this morning. It was nice and fresh, but it's been an absolutely glorious day today, um, which was, and it was topped off with a couple of yellow-tailed black cockatoos flying over my house this afternoon, which was wonderful. I wanted to pay my respects to the First Nations elders past and present uh, and extend that respect to any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander peoples who are joining us tonight as well. Um, I also want to recognise your continued connection to land, to water and to community, including the amazing birds that have brought us all here together tonight. But I am not the person you want to see. Uh, I am really thrilled to introduce you to my amazing friend and colleague, Sean Dooley. Uh, Sean's not your average bird enthusiast. He is, I think it's safe to say, an absolute bird nerd. Uh, he's our National Public Affairs Manager at BirdLife Australia, which basically means, I think, Sean, you get to talk to a lot of people about birds and the issues that they face. Um, he's become, you know, really, this is a role that's perfect for him. Uh, so Sean's incredibly passionate about uh, our feathered friends and his passion is really quite infectious um, and he's really a go-to expert. I send him many inquiries <laughs> all the time. Uh, he's also an author. He's written The Big Twitch in 2005, which maybe he might tell us a little bit about. Um, and he's also written for places like The Guardian and he was once the editor of the Australian BirdLife magazine. Um, Sean has travelled far and wide chasing down <laughs> birds wherever he can um, and he continues to try and do that uh, when time permits um, but it's not just about numbers I think it's safe to say that Sean is really all about sharing his knowledge um, and excite and igniting an excitement in birds in others so get ready everybody um, I'd like to introduce you to Sean Dooley. Oh, great well thank you very much Holly and, and thank you to everyone coming tonight it's uh, really uh, Really, really quite uh, nerve wracking seeing the numbers of people turning up uh, to see this. It's a bit of a trip down memory lane for for our lockdown days doing something on Zoom again. Uh, so I hope I hope it's not triggering people and they you don't have PTSD having to sit and do a Zoom thing. But it's it's a great way to to connect. And I'm I'm talking to you day, today from Boonarong Country, uh, which is in the south east of Melbourne, which is where I grew up and where I fell in love with birds. And that was actually a fairly long time ago now. Um, for, for a long time, I was able to feel like I was one of the young guns in the birding scene. But I think the grey hairs and the fact that I can say that I, uh, you know, I remember seeing birds 40 years ago is sort of giving away the fact that I'm not really one of the young guns. But thinking back to those times when I growing up on Boonarong country and which was right on the edge of Melbourne. Uh, we had a beat, the beach, we had bush along the creek. We had still had farmland nearby, which is unfortunately gone. And we've, but we also had um, Seaford wetlands with or the swamp as we knew it as kids. And that uh, thinking about bird identification for beginners has thrown me back 40 years to, to when I first fell in love with birds and, and what it was that I, how I learned 
the bird uh, to identify birds. As Holly said, I I did the book I wrote was called The Big Twitch, which is where I travelled around Australia trying to smash the Australian bird watching record for seeing the most birds in one year. Uh, in, that was 20 years ago to, in 2002, and I managed to see by today's taxonomy over 725 species of birds, uh, of which I had to identify them all. But I'd had 30 years of experience to do that, and what I wanted to focus on today, for those of you, I'm really pitching it to people who are new to birding and just want to get a few tips. I'm not going to go through, uh, you know, feather by feather for how to identify separate birds, but more just the principles that you can use and adapt um, to, to help you enjoy birding more. Because the thing about bird watching is birds delight us no matter what, what they are and what, what name they are. If we don't know the name of a bird, that doesn't restrict you or inhibit your enjoyment of seeing that bird because birds are pretty magnificent creatures. They, you know, they sing in a multitude of voices and they come in an infinite array of patterns and colours. And you can still get enjoyment from a bird, from looking at birds, watching birds, listening to birds without knowing what they are. But I certainly think that the the experience of being in nature is enhanced when you know the names of the characters that you're looking at. It's just like with your favourite, you know, your favourite drama or soap opera or comedy or, or, or even, you know, reality show it really does impact the effect that that they have on you when you know who these characters are that you're watching and once you can put a name to them not only does it mean you can add birds to your list with the correct name and you know that you're correctly identifying them which is what we need from you if you're going to be helping us at BirdLife Australia um, telling us what you see whether it's in the Aussie bird count or through Birds in Backyards, or in the Bird Data Program. We need to know what you're seeing so that we can collect that information and know that it's accurate, and we can use that to analyse the trends of Australian uh, Australian birds and how they're going. But even if, um, but for you, once you know those names, you really start to appreciate the birds more and you get to understand their behaviour more because you know what you're looking at. And you'll start to see, once you've recognised those birds, that they not only look different, but they do behave differently. And that can be just as enriching and, and fascinating as actually just the challenge of identifying the birds. And that's something certainly that I've found is after I'd done the big twitch, you know, I'd had 20 years of birding. Um, I'd seen over 700 birds in Australia. I pretty much blew my inheritance. So uh, traveling around Australia, looking for those birds. So I really didn't have the that many opportunities to see new birds for my list but in the time since then I've I've sort of enjoyed my birding even even more if that's possible because I've got to go back and see the birds that I already knew and start to learn even more about where they occur what they're doing when they're here and 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 things like that so that's sort of the reason why I think philosophically learning to identify birds is really important now, when I started as a 10-year-old, I was like this sponge that I just sat, you know, my favourite bird books, uh, my favourite books wasn't um, Lord of the Rings or anything. It was like reading old copies of the Bird Observer magazine or uh, when my parents bought me a field guide for Christmas, it was only volume one of Peter Slater's guide. So I knew the non-passerines really well. Um, I never got volume two. But so I was just soaking everything up. Uh, like a sponge as you do when you're kids but so so it's easy for those of us who've been around for a while and got used to bird watching to to forget the challenges of just identifying that the simplest birds the birds you get in your neighborhood in your backyard so i'm going to try and bring that back to basic principles so what for those of you who watched the show ted lasso you might have heard ted ted a couple of times in different episodes he says to his fellow coach named Coach, Coach Beard, he says, bird by bird, Coach, bird by bird. And that's actually from a book about writing by a, a woman called Anne Lamott. And it's about the challenge, facing the challenge of writing when, you, when you're trying to write a book or a story or something and being overwhelmed by the possibilities in front of you. And she takes that phrase bird by bird, and it means just take one thing at a time. 
But interestingly, the bird by bird philosophy actually comes from when she was a, a kid, her brother was doing an assignment on birds and he hadn't finished the assignment and had to hand it in the next day. And her, her father said to her brother, her father was an author as well. And her, her father said to him, look, look, son, just take it bird by bird. Take one piece and get that done and don't worry about the big picture and the smaller details will fill in the big picture. So what I'm proposing today is that we take back the bird by bird for the birds and actually look at, um, because this is essentially how I learned to, to identify birds, is you don't need to identify everything all at once, all the time. Um, it's just too overwhelming. And when you think about it, Australia has recorded, bird watchers in Australia in the last 240 years have recorded over 900 species of birds. So if you were to get your typical field guide, and this, this is the great uh, CSIRO field guide, Australian bird guide, you can see here how thick it is. It's I think it's actually 2.3 kilos in weight. So if you get a, a typical field, field guide, um, you, you know, you open it up and there is just page after page of birds. It is really daunting. And if you've seen a bird in your backyard, you don't have no idea where it is, trying to pick up a field guide or even an app um, can, can just almost want to make you put off actually trying to identify because it just seems too hard. So my philosophy for bird uh, for bird identification is that essentially you you but take it bird by bird and bird bird identification is like a language. It's not just the language of understanding the bird calls, which is a whole other area which we won't really get into tonight because each bird's song or calls that they make as often as uniquely identifiable to that species as the way they look. Um, but but bird watching is really like learning a language. Burning, a birding is, is essentially like a language, but unlike if you're saying trying to learn Spanish or, um, you know, or, or French or, or Chinese, uh, the, the problem with that is, again, you get lots of words and grammar and phrases thrown at you. And if you don't have that immersion between your lessons, this is why I'm so bad at, at languages. I, I'm good in the class, but I completely forget it once I've, once I've left the room. Um, and, and I come back next week, I can't remember anything because I don't have that immersion. The advantage you have about learning birds and bird identification is that you have the opportunity to have that immersion in birds the entire time in between when you delve into a field guide or or into the uh you know into your actual uh into your app or, or wherever because birds are all around us and that's one of the best things about um about birds as they are the evident part of nature that we see every day obviously we see plants as well um, but birds in terms of creatures are really the only the only ones we have all around us, no matter where we are. And the great thing in Australia is even in the most dense, densely settled cities, we still have a lot of birds to, to look at and learn from. So that, um, so that is the, the key, I think, is that you, once you start on your birding journey, you can always practice and you don't need to head off to the gates of some remote national park before you can do birding. You can, bird watching is something you can do everywhere and at any time. It's, I liken it to, it's really like pelvic floor exercises. You can be doing it and people won't even notice you're doing it when you're just standing at the bus stop. You can be bird watching the whole time. So it's that constant immersion in it. But what it is, is I, I take the idea of it being the basic unit principle is you don't need to know 930 odd different birds. You just need to know essentially one bird. If you can become familiar with one bird, then you, you can start to work out what the other birds are. And that's that basic unit model. And if you think that it still seems too hard, when you think about it, humans are geared to look for patterns. Um, our brain works in looking for patterns and looking at anom anomalies in those regular patterns. Um, and so it might be difficult if, you're, if you've got a, a lineup of 930 odd species of birds in front of you. But if you just know a few, you will begin to 
be, begin to work out what's different to the ones you know. And we do it all the time in our lives anyway. We, we just um, need to relax into it. For instance, some of you may be football followers. Um, some of you may not be. But probably even those of you who are dead set against footy uh, and find it a complete waste of time, you probably know many of the teams, if not the individual players. And when you think about it, it's probably because you get to know one or two originally. So say if it's AFL, maybe you might know Collingwood, you know, the Magpies, black and white. So immediately you're going, okay, I've got that black and white stripe. I'm, maybe I know the, the Mason Cox story, the, the American seven-foot basketballer who came out and played for the Magpies. So you'll immediately have that reference. And then you can see that, you know, you'll see another football jumper and it's a different colour. It doesn't have stripes. It's, you know, it's red and white with no stripes. And then you'll start to let, if you learn the name for that, the Sydney Swans. And it's amazing, even for those who don't like football, they will have, uh, they, they will probably know all the teams. And the same with the NRL. Like, uh, you know, I don't follow it closely growing up in Melbourne, but I know as soon as I see red and green that it's going to be the Rabbitohs. Uh, and that's not something I tried to learn. It's just that thing where I knew one team and then I started to learn what was different about it. So it's the same principle with birds. And also you, the more you know, the more differences you'll note. So with football, you might notice that, say, a tall player, you'll start to identify the way they run or the tall player or the broad player or the dirty player and you'll get to know them individually, um, you know, or the, the player that's running away from a booze bus, you'll, you'll think, I know who that is. And it's amazing. You'll do that without even really learning about it. Um, <laughs> yes, what is this football of which I speak? Exactly. Uh, so anyone can, um, using that principle, that inherent innate ability of humans to process information uh, recognize the familiar and then start to look at what's different and note those differences. And that's essentially the, sim the, the, the simplicity of bird identification. And it, it came to me one time really clearly when we were on a, a Twitchathon, uh, which for those of you who don't know, it's a, it's a fundraising event that BirdLife Australia runs. It's particularly big in New South Wales. And it's a 24 hour or an eight hour, whatever the parameters of the race. It's a bird counting race. So you drive around or cycle around, move around the, the, the state you're in, trying to see as many birds as possible in, in that time period. And it gets very competitive uh, and the teams are out to win. And we pulled up in my team at the Western Treatment Plant, Werribee Sewage Farm one time, and we only had a very limited time because we were running behind schedule. And we pulled up and there was a flock of probably about 5,000 shorebirds in front of us. Now, for a lot of uh, even, even, you know, fairly well-experienced bird watchers, I've been amazed. A lot of people love shorebirds because they present an ID challenge, but a lot of experienced bird watchers actually resile from even going near trying to work out what they are because they're, they're, they're all too difficult, they tell me. They say, oh, they're just those little brown birds out on the mud flats. Too hard to work out. But we arrived and there's like, you know, thousands of these birds swarming over the mud flats at, at, out at Werribee. And we only had like 20 minutes before we had to move on to the next bit. So I, I realised within about a minute, I picked out a bird, a very rare bird called a long-toed stint. Now, it's not that I'm a brilliant uh, shorebird expert. I've, I've spent a lot of time with people who are, and they can sit there and look at a bird and tell you not just what species it is, but what subspecies and and whether, you know, it was a first year or second year bird. And uh, even some, you know, almost down to the fact that they can tell you what date it was born by the length of the feathers that are growing on the wings. I'm not in that league at all, but I was able to pretty much instantaneously pick out this one bird among 5,000 others that, that that wasn't the usual sharp-tailed sandpipers or redneck stints, which are my basic units. And what I realised then, like the other bird is we're going, how did you find that? And what it was, was I was looking at that basic unit. I was looking for the sharp-tailed sandpiper, which is the one that I see the most. And I'd got to know that. And then I also got to know the, the more common one, like the redneck stint. And the redneck stint, I 
knew from from the sharp-tailed sandpiper from early on because I worked out it's the smaller one. So the sharp-tailed sandpiper is my basic unit. Anything smaller, you, you immediately notice. Also, it's a lot greyer. So I had picked that out different to the sharp-tailed sandpiper. So when I was looking at those two species in their hundreds, if not thousands, in this flock, suddenly I saw a small bird that wasn't grey, but it was very the similar colour to the sharp-tailed sandpiper. And that caught my attention. It was that difference. And the, the long-toed stint is like a miniature version of the sharp-tailed sandpiper. So immediately I was, because of that experience that I'd had, I'd narrowed it down and then was able to, to pick it and, and turned out to be correct. But that's at the long, that's at the end of a long process. You can do that with any type of bird. It doesn't, it, it works really well with shorebirds. Uh, yes, yeah, someone said, how do you know it's not just a small sharp-tailed stint, sharp-tailed sandpiper? Well, that's 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 where it gets more technical. But I picked out that difference. And I, because I had the experience, I was able to immediately go to long-tailed stint. But that's the point where you would go and check the field guide or check with your birding companions. One of the best ways to learn birds, as, as an aside, is to go out with somebody who's more experienced. I find being out in the field and seeing those birds and having them explained to you is, is infinitely more memorable than poring over the books or the apps. Uh, it's just something about seeing the bird and being um, t being told or, or learning what it is on that spot is, is really good. It, bird, birding and successful bird ID really is that thing, like I said, immersion helps, but you get better by doing. And it can be doing in the books or or online, but there's nothing I've found, especially for bird calls, that beats actually being out in the field, and um, especially if you can go with someone who's more experienced. But obviously, we can't always go out with people who are more experienced with uh, with birds than we are. So, um, so that un that basic unit works really well for shorebirds, and it works well for shorebirds because you have. Um, a great variety of birds, they're variations on a theme. And so once you get into shorebirds, you'll see there's, you know, we have 35, 36 regularly occurring migratory shorebirds in Australia, which essentially are all similar looking units. They're all grey, grey, brown when they're here in non-breeding plumage, but they're variations on a theme. So if you know one or two, you can say, well, this bird has a longer bill than a sharp-tailed sandpiper, or this bird has shorter legs or this bird is bigger that sort of thing so you can start to spread out from the, the bird you know you you sort of get concentric layers of birds that are similar and that you're going to encounter and that's how you learn as i said it, it's just bird by bird a, as you go with that basic unit um because bird watching really is about noticing the differences uh in, in things and that's how you notice not just between species but you can start to notice uh, bird, birds don't make it easy sometimes to identify because you you not only have different species, but within the one species. Some birds, like I noticed in the chat that was asking, how do you tell a male red wattle bird from a female? They're really hard to tell because they're essentially identical. I think the red, the male red wattle bird's slightly larger, but you'd have to have them side by side. But there are other birds like, say, a golden whistler or a fairy wren, like a splendid fairy wren or a superb fairy wren, where you have a difference in males and females, but you also have difference in males in breeding plumage and non-breeding plumage. So it can get really complex. But if you take it back to that bird by bird thing, where you start to learn the one bird, you get to know it really well, then you can work out the differences. Um, the so, so that's sort of just the basics. And it, it sort of makes sense. But um, it, it's something, again, it, it just with practice. Now, as we're sort of moving on, time's, time's moving on. So I'll just give you a few more kind of concrete tips that I picked up when I was learning. And one of them I said is, is that point when you get ready to consult the field guide. Now, it might be a physical field guide like, like this one, or it, it could be one of the apps. Um, the a couple of the field guides like the Pizzy and Knight have an app and also the Morecambe field guide has its equivalent of an app. But also there are other apps that you can use, um, things like the Merlin app from, from Cornell University uh, can be really valuable or um, it, it's still developing in terms of how good it is for Australian birds or even the Aussie Bird Count app 
uh, which you can use throughout the year, um, even, even outside of the counting time. You can't do the count, but you can use the field guide section of that. And the, the good thing about things like the Aussie Bird Count app and the Merlin app is they allow you to enter the deets, the basic details of the birds that you've yeah. seen. And then it can give you suggestions of what's likely in the neighbourhood uh, or the district that you are. Now, neither of them are perfect. It's still that sort of machine learning thing and we're having to refine it each year. It get, they both get better and better. But at least it starts to give you an idea. But... One of the things that's really important, I think, is when you're in the field is actually taking notes. Don't rely on your memory to have a photographic image of what you've seen. And this is really important because, especially if you're re referring to field guides, in the moment when you see a new bird, like there's a lot of emotions going. There's, there's fear that you're going to miss out on it, like that it's going to fly off. Um, you're trying to soak it all in. There's excitement uh, and, and, and you, like your memories can actually get jumbled up and and things, it's almost like, I was about to say bird, seeing a new bird is like being being in a car crash, like time goes differently, but but it's, it's a much more exciting and enjoyable experience than a car crash. Believe me, I've been in a couple of those and yeah, I, I'd rather see a new bird. But the, um, the, the really interesting thing is that if you're trying to look on your app or your field guide as you're looking at the bird, what's going to happen in the way you're laying down your memories is that you will be swapping information that you're getting in. And it's very hard to remember afterwards which is the, the view that you saw in real life or which was the view that you saw in on the field guide. And there's, there's a classic example of this, the, um, the Peter Slater field guide. Which, which is a really nice one. Uh, the, um, this is the 2009 edition, which is the, the last one that Peter did before he died. And actually, this, this is a, a Peter Slater um, uh, print that, that he, he, he painted as well. Um, a beautiful artist and a real pioneer in, in bird identification and making birding popular in Australia. In the previous edition to this, I, I actually don't have it anymore, there was a printer error in the in the field guide and i'll just show you the page where the error occurred it was fixed in the next edition but on the cuckoo's page um on the cuckoo's page i think if you see here you can see here there's the horsefields bronze cuckoo and the bronze cuckoos represent a very difficult challenge as you can probably see there they're, they're all fairly similar looking birds but the classic was in in this previous edition of the slater field guide for the Horsefield Bronze Cuckoo, the undertail can be a really important uh, feature. There was a there was an error in the printing, and a little red dot got got printed accidentally on that undertail. And one of our my colleagues at BirdLife Australia, uh, who was working in woodland birds at the time, somebody reported in a survey. They 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 were actually out surveying, and they came and, and told him that they'd just seen a Horsefield Bronze Cuckoo in an area where you wouldn't normally get it. And our colleague Chris was saying, are you sure that it was horse fields and not a shining bronze cuckoo? Because you don't really get horse fields in this sort of habitat. And they said, no, 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 we're absolutely sure. It even had the diagnostic red spot on the undertail. Now, what had happened, that bird didn't have a red spot on the undertail, but what had happened was they were looking at the bird, looking at the field guide, looking at the bird, looking at the field guide, and those memories that were layered got confused. And so in their minds, they'd actually literally seen a red spot that didn't exist. So it's really important and um, to take notes uh, if, if you're seeing new birds. And I think, um, you know, I, I still do it. I still prefer using my, my notebook. I do have apps when I'm going, when I'm going birding and doing surveys in bird data, I will sometimes do do them directly into, into the app rather than coming back and entering it, doing that double entry on the computer uh, to save time. But I still really do enjoy doing note, uh, notebooks um, because you can put in things that you can't fit into an app, like little impressions. My notebooks aren't particularly detailed, but they are, you know, they'll have little behavioural notes or or odd bits of plumage, which which is much more awkward to do when you when you're entering stuff into an app. And so it is really good to note down what you're seeing. And 
this was a trick that I was taught very early. And this is the, I am the worst artist in the world, as you're about to see. Um, but this is kind of like a foolproof way of sketching birds in order to aid your identification. And I've actually got a notebook here that I had from 1983 when I was a, a, a little junior bird watcher. And I saw a bird down at uh, Seaford Swamp that I'd never seen before, and I was pretty sure of what it was. But just to make sure that I got it right, I didn't have a field guide on me at the time, as I adopted this method, and you can probably see the bird was actually a grey currawong. Um, and if you can see here, yeah, I, you just do a very simple two circles with a line through the middle. And the two circles are um, the head and the body. So basically you're doing this, do the line through the middle, and then you, you don't have to be an artist. You can just draw an arrow to where the features of the bird are. And that that's the thing. You're looking bird by bird. You're looking for the things that are different to what you know. So this bird was about magpie size, a bit bigger than a magpie. I was able to jot that down in the notes. But I knew it wasn't a magpie. And back then, pie currawongs weren't common at all in, um, <clears throat> in the... Uh, in that part of Melbourne. <clears throat> and so, you know, I, I wasn't sure if it was pied or grey currawong or what it was. So I was able to use that magpie as the basic unit. And I've got here like bigger, than, a bit bigger than a magpie, bill like a magpie. So you, you can draw the lines onto those actual um, features and, and the sort of topography of the bird. And then you can go and look in, in your field guide, either there in the field or back once you're home, you can if you've got um, something or go on the internet, and it really helps because it means that you've got something down in uh, on paper that that you've done at the time, rather than something that you, that's a hybrid of what you've been seeing. And it also means that you you're putting in the features that were apparent to you, rather than what the field guide was telling you. Because you can look at a field guide, and there could be a dozen different things. Um, that, that stand out, uh, that, that separate that bird. You don't really know. The field guides can be really good at pointing out the differences, but at the time in the field, when, when you're looking at this bird flitting around, you're only getting brief glimpses. You might not get all of those diagnostic features. And one of the things I'd also recommend is to not just rely on one diagnostic feature because that can really throw you. You know, you, you might have a, um, you, you, you might sort of think, a, and I've seen people do this, say for the scrub wrens, they, they sort of get told that, well, the yellow-throated scrub wren has the black bandit mask uh, on it. And so if you see a scrub wren in, in the bottom of your garden and you think, oh, that's got a black mask, so it must be a yellow-throated yellow scrub wren. If you're relying on that one feature, I don't know if you'll be able to see this in, in the book here, if those top two species, the, the white-browed scrub wren in, in a lot of cases also has a bit of a black bandit mask just with different features around it. So it's really valuable to write down as much as you see that stands out. Um, that's, uh, th th that's a really good thing. We're, we're also really fortunate at the moment that with digital photography, taking a camera with you, um, you know, even if you're not a bird photographer, taking a simple camera, even a phone camera might give you enough uh, to, to remind you or be able to compare with the field guide or with the app afterwards. Um, it's, yeah, it, 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 I'm just trying to think, we, we want to leave time for questions. So, that, but that little method is, is a, a, of drawing a bird, as, as you saw, probably saw in my notebook, it's terrible artistry but it actually enables you to very simply work out where, um, where the features are on the bird that you've noticed that you can then look at when, when you're going back to the, uh, back to the books. Um, and the, the, the important thing when you're looking at bird photography to identify birds is that, especially with digital photography, often the camera compensates for what you're seeing in real life. It's compensating for light. And so you've got to remember that often the shading and things like that that happen in a digital photograph in particular aren't necessarily what you've been seeing. So it's still really valuable to write down a few impressions of that strange bird that you see. Um, yeah, uh, the, uh, another tip I'd give you is, is be very careful about size. It's a very difficult thing to juggle 
um, uh, to, to judge uh, with the size of a bird, especially if you're fairly inexperienced. Bird size is very subjective um, as to how you interpret whether something's large. Sometimes size is important in terms of the, the bulk of a bird. A bird might actually literally be the same size, but it's a bulkier looking bird. And relying on size uh, can be very misleading, uh, particularly for, for very similar species. And, and I think one of the best examples is the Australian and the little raven. Um, now they both occur, to, they're, they're one of the corvids that will occur together in, in cities. Usually each city, each capital city has a dominant uh, corvid. So for Sydney, it's Australian raven. For Melbourne, it's little raven. But both of those occur um, both species occur on the fringes of both of those cities. Uh, places like in, in Perth, it's Australian raven, and, and really that's the only one you're going to get. There's Teresian crow further north and little crow inland. But, but with Australian and little raven, they often get confused, particularly down here in Victoria, because people misjudge the size of a little raven be because they're misled by the name. Unfortunately, bird names don't always reflect the best feature of the bird to identify it. And little ravens technically are little in the sense that they're one centimetre shorter in length than Australian ravens. So I, I defy anyone to be able to discern a bird from 50 metres away, whether it's, whether it's one centimetre shorter than it should be. And because people think that um, the bird they saw was really big, it couldn't possibly be a little raven. We end up getting a whole lot of erroneous reports of little ravens around Melbourne. They're, they're actually very rare around Melbourne and usually only found in the forested areas like the Dandenongs or the Yu Yangs or areas like King Lake and those sorts of places. Very rare in the suburbs. And a lot of the records that we have, we're still trying to sift through them for bird data. Uh, we think that even some experienced people, I, I made that mistake for probably the first two years that I was bird watching because I still hadn't got to learn the other features about Australian ravens. So that's a, that's another tip I'd give you is that, um, yeah, just be very careful with size. Uh, it's more the shape and and the the bulk of the bird that that's important rather than the size because that can be misleading. Another valuable tip, and this is something that really comes into play when you're learning the birds in your backyard, is, is habits and call and habitat use. And the, the way, and also the, the, the time of year that a bird is there, that has a lot of, um, that, that can play into identification uh, really, really importantly. And there is a tendency when you're starting birding, and it's a tendency that still happens with, with the most experienced birders, is people naturally want to see rare birds. Unusual is more exciting. So, um, so you need to, and the great thing about birds is that even if you bird in the same backyard, go bird watching the same time, Unusual species will occur. Birds have wings, they move around, and they can occur anywhere. So you can never rule out that you're seeing something rare. But I would urge that you think of the common options first because it becomes very easy to do this mind game where you see a bird and you think, oh, that doesn't look quite right for the bird that I know. And you might see something slightly different. So it's a very interesting mind game where you start going oh that could possibly be something rare and it's just this shift where you start going from possible to probable to definite as you convince yourself and as I say as you lay down those memories you start um and you're referring back to books you might start thinking oh I did see that I did see that so um the temptation is always to find the rare the rare bird but the really important thing is uh, especially if you're contributing to the Aussie bird count or, or birds in backyard surveys, is it doesn't help us if you send us a really exotic list and actually it doesn't help us in terms of our time because we then have to go through and verify everything if there's unusual sightings because science is at the heart of everything we do at BirdLife Australia and we want to make sure that the data we're using is as um, robust as possible. So if we have to then go back and question a whole lot of stuff, it actually becomes a very resource intensive system for us to, to work with your citizen science that you're, um, that you're actually bringing to us. So learning things like 
their habitats, where they should occur, where they would normally occur, what normally occurs in your area and how they use the space that, that they're in can be really valuable. For instance, thornbills are those little brown jobs that, that really drive a lot of people mad trying to identify because they're always flitting about in the foliage. But you once you get to know how they act, that can be almost as useful in identifying the species as what they look like. For instance, on the East Coast, the brown thornbill and the striated thornbill will often occur in the same habitat. But often it's what they're doing is a, as good a guide to what species you're looking at as, as what they actually look like. And with thornbills, as people probably know, they're just sitting around all over the place. You can very rarely get a good view when you want a good view. And for instance, the, the, the striated thornbill is a um, very much a, a foliage gleaner. It, it feeds on insects from leaves generally. And usually it's those leaves that are up in the canopy of a tree. They will come down lower into shrubs and other things, but they're always tending to feed on the edges of the trees, um, not, not usually so much in, in, probing into bark or anything. And so they're around leaves, they're up, they're flying around a lot more. Whereas a brown thornbill is far more Catholic in its preference for where it will actually feed. And so they can be up high in the um, a glee, gleaning insects from the foliage, but they also come down very low. They also probe in the bark. They um, so, so they're more likely, if you see a bird down low, that's often more likely to be a brown thornbill than it is a striated thornbill. So you get, it's not a hard and fast rule, but that understanding of the behaviour of the birds just as much as what they look like will help you determine whether this strange new bird is indeed something different. Um, so that's that's a, a really, um, you know, it, it's fairly basic. Like, like I said with the Ted Lasso quote, bird by bird, um, the more that you get to know and immerse yourself in your local birds, the more you'll start to see the differences and your knowledge will radiate out. You don't need to be some sort of um, twitcher savant who learns every, you know, every picture in the in the bird book. Um, to, to start to learn birds, it's take it easy, take it, take it at your own pace. And what you get then is, is you get the joy of discovery elongated over time um ever since i was a, a a kid often going out with the young members of the bird observers club and even today take take taking school groups out or that or or young birders out new birders if they see everything at once it's sort of an information overload and that delight that you get of of chasing something desiring to see something and finally getting it is sort of lost so i actually envy people i really do the, the, I, my favourite feelings uh, are those those times when I was just starting out bird watching and everything was new and to discover a bird that now I've seen thousands of thousands of times a bird like a golden whistler a male golden whistler or a silver eye for the first time to that thrill of discovery and uh, sort of accentuated by the fact that that. You, you're learning, you're you, using the knowledge that you've learnt to, to work out what that bird is. That thrill has never left me. And, and it's still um, looking in my old notebooks or even just going out to my old haunts and doing my regular um, bird data monthly surveys for my local patch. That still sustains me, that, that excitement and, and, and the joy of discovering something new and, and discovering that, getting to know those birds. So that's... That's sort of the, really, it's it's very basic and you might be thinking, oh, God, we didn't really learn anything. But I assure you, if you actually just follow those principles, you will learn very, you'll be surprised at how quickly you do learn. And also, it's the way to enjoy birds as you're learning. There are, as I said, there are lots of resources out there that can help. And we're in a much better place than we were when I was a kid, when you know, there was still only one field guide when I started bird watching. Um, one one proper field guide. The the first Pizzy guide came out in the second year I was bird watching, so that that was great. And then the Simpson and Day after that. But now we have apps. We have um, we have websites like Xeno Canto where you can listen to bird calls. Doesn't really help if you don't know what the name of the bird is that you're trying to find. But things like Merlin and other apps are actually starting to work on identifying bird song like a Shazam for birds. But there's lots of online resources. There's lots of brilliant um, 
field guides and local guides. Uh, the BirdLife Australia website, it, which is just a new, web, we've redeveloped the website and we're slowly populating it with great information about birds and beautiful photos. There's the, the Birds in Backyards website, uh, which, which is birdsinbackyards.net, which has fabulous resources for helping you identify birds. There's the Aussie Bird Count app, which you can download and just use as a as like a, a field guide app. So that's, um, yeah, so, so there are so many resources now and there are, talk to other birders, check out BirdLife Australia's website or, or try and find out about your local BirdLife Australia branch because they run the branches. We have about 35 around the country. They have all sorts of activities, especially if, uh, a lot of them have uh, beginner's bird walks. And that's where you'll make those connections with people who are willing to share their knowledge and their passion. And you get to learn a hell of a lot, as I've said. So I think that's probably where I'll leave it. So we've got another 10 minutes or so for, for questions. The way we're going to do it, um, people I think have been putting questions in the meeting chat and Holly's going to moderate those and pick the ones you, you found of interest, I guess. And um, we'll see if I can help out with any of those. Although Holly will probably have more answers than I will, I suspect. <laughs> I tried to answer a few, but there were lots of great questions and lots of really good discussion with people sharing their knowledge as well, which has been fantastic to see. Um, first up, thanks so much, Sean. That was from what I could listen to in between letting people in and, and going to the chat. That was amazing and full of tips, even things that I should be using when I go out and, and on the rare occasions I get to go and do some birding. Um, there's a few questions that jumped out at me that I thought were quite uh, broad and so um, so we'll cover off on a few of those sure. um, you talked a little bit about field guides do you have a personal preference is there one you like for one reason or um, different ones for different situations I, I, we're really lucky in Australia in that the all the field guides we've had have been pretty good um, I, I have to say that the, the this this is my personal favorite now um, and, and in some ways I'd stopped using field guides because I had looked at the others so often that I kind of almost didn't need to open them up. I knew what the illustrations were on the page. Um, so when this came out, oh, what was it, about six or seven years ago now, um, the, the Australian Bird Guide by CSIRO, it was kind of like seeing Australian birds with fresh eyes again for me. Um, I remember particularly the honey eater section. I was going, oh, wow, that's right. They're so, yeah, because I got just got used to the other ones. So I, I don't think, um, you know, I don't have a stake in any. <laughs> I'm not getting a, a little payola for recommending any. But, yeah, currently I use the Australian Bird Guide because it is the newest and it's the most comprehensive. And there is a, there is now a, um, this was a bit ridiculous taking into the field. It was like a mini handbook, really. The information in there was brilliant, but it was just a bit much. But they have brought out now a, a compact guide, which has still got a, well over 500 odd species in it. And it's amazing what they can cram in to the tiny pages there. So if it was going, um, if I was going out, I'd throw this in my backpack. But I, but I, I do have the, uh, the Morka map. Uh, which is really useful, um, uh, particularly for subspecies and things. And I used to have the Pisian Night app, but when I changed phones, I lost it and I just haven't got it back yet. Another app that I've got that I've found really useful is the uh, the David Stewart Bird Sound. Uh, I've just I've got to find out what it is. Anyway, David Stewart, who did the recordings for the Morka map, actually produced his own app recently. Uh, just came out last year. It's called David Stewart Australian Bird Calls. Uh, and that that I find that really interesting, really valuable because he has a lot of the different calls of subspecies and Australian birds are uh, that we have dialects with Australian birds. So especially if I'm on, in an unfamiliar area and I hear a call I don't know, it's a really good one. Like I've got enough knowledge that I'll go, well, that sounds, sounds like a grey shrike thrush, but not quite. And so I can go and check those subspecies that whether they fit or not so yeah that, that's what I use but I um I've kind of grown up on the other field guides over the years and just know them so well I kind of don't need to look at them anymore thanks Sean I admit it took me a long time to switch over 
to apps. I kept forgetting that I had this great resource yeah. in my pocket when I would go out burning and I didn't need to log the, the field guide out. Um, so it takes a while. And I think it can often be seen as a little bit daunting because for an app, they're very expensive. They're $40, $50. But, you know, it is a field guide, which, you know, if you pay for a, a hard copy, you're paying $40 anyway, that has calls and things built in as well. So it took me a little find- bit of a, a mind shift. Yeah, I do still prefer the um, a, a field guide book if I don't know what the bird is because you can sort of see them all together much easier. Um, oh, and I, sh- I should mention, I'm not sure if I'm allowed to mention this, but stay tuned. Uh, BirdLife Australia is working with uh, the Sunbird app to create an Australian bird app. That might be, uh, that might be embargoed news, but... Um, Anyway, you heard it here first. Uh, it, it's not ready yet, but there's... No something. one heard anything, Sean. No one, yes. You heard nothing. <laughs> you heard, heard nothing. nothing. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So a couple of other questions that were coming up a little bit were, um, what do you look for in a pair of binoculars, Sean? Yeah. Um, I think, like, the the optics now are, are fantastic. Um you know, my, I think a lot of people started off like they had some sort of great uncle who was a Navy captain. And so they had these big, you know, these big binoculars that they'd lug around. I must admit, I I currently have these, which are very, quite very big binoculars. These are 10 by 50s. And the reason I have them is one that I like the magnification so that, you know, if you're looking at shorebirds a long way out or seabirds, you know, the, the 10 really brings the birds to you. But the, the 50, 10 by 50, makes them very heavy. Um, so a lot of people don't like that to lug these around. The reason I've got them is I've got a bit of a tremor. And what I found with binoculars that were smaller was that, you know, when I'm when I'm looking, and especially if I'm being out in the field and haven't eaten and things, my tremor is a bit, bit more pronounced. So it's very hard to stabilise the image. And a lot of people had suggested that I get lighter binoculars, so I wasn't struggling with them. But then somebody uh, um, suggested actually, no, getting the bigger ones with the bigger field of vision so that it means even if the binoculars are moving around, the centre is still um, fairly stable. So that's that's what I go for. But a lot of people prefer the lighter ones, and I can perfectly understand why. Um, the, so often 8 by 40s or 8 by 42 or even the 10 by 42s tend to be the the one of choice as to brands the 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 high end brands are all brilliant i've got swarovskis and i've i love them but i've i've also looked through likers and zeiss and they're just a, they're pretty excellent too can't really fault them either but there is a whole good that those high end are you know you're looking at 2 grand or more to which is a big layout but they're I would recommend not getting cheap binoculars, nothing under $100, but there is this mid-range from a bit, maybe about $200 up. Um, it's really worth investing in those. They might not last as long as the high-end ones, but they're for what the, the value you get from them, um, there's a whole range. I can't remember all the brand names, but things like I think it's the Skyhawk and um, one of the Likers, I think, is, is in that range, and some of the Nikon ones as well. They're they're really good. Those mid those sort of two to seven hundred dollar ones because you'll get a lot of use out of them. Ah, oh, yes, is that are they the Nikon? I've got Nikon Monarchs. The, Monarchs, the sort of that's mid, it. yeah, yeah, they're great. I love them. I can't fault them. Yeah, yeah, they're, that they're not. They probably don't the quality that they they don't last like like the high end ones. At, you know, twenty like my previous pair I had for over twenty years. Um, so, but but they're still for for at least you'll get a good five to ten years of value out of them, and they're they're pretty good. Yeah, other yeah, vortex. Mine, that's another good one. Yeah, mine are pushing ten and doing pretty well. But yes, but I'm not going and doing a lot of short bird work and things either. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, look, there's still lots of good questions around, so I'm going to have a look just before we finish up. Oh, this I thought this one was interesting. Um, so someone was asked recently about migratory birds in central Victoria. They tend to think more of shorebirds as being migratory. Yeah. Um, but she's wondering what some of the more common um, 
Australian migratory, inland terrestrial migratory birds might be? Yeah, well, that's uh, what I was talking about, getting to know your local birds. Um, you will get to know that there, there's a shift in populations um, and it's stuff that I'm I'm still learning about and, and experiencing the more I look. And, yeah, we don't have the same visible migration that they have in North America or, um, or, or Northern Europe in particular, but we still have a lot of migration and we also have lots of, I, I, you could call it nomadic, birds, but it's more that they follow general patterns. So especially, say, central Victoria that you're talking about, that's a fascinating place because you get the summer migrants. So you'll get birds like uh, rainbow bee eaters in southern Australia are migratory. Uh, dollar birds in the river systems are migratory. Um, they'll come down to the Goulburn and Murray areas. But um, but then you get things like, say, lead and flycatcher. Uh, is a summer migrant. Most of the cuckoos tend to be summer migrants, although they do hang around uh, the further north you go and you can get fantail cuckoos almost any time of year in northern Victoria or, well, parts of Victoria and horse fields, bronze often hang around, but they often don't call again until the spring. So those, the cuckoos, and then you'll get things like the song larks uh, are migratory and they have a fascinating migration. They'll migrate down one I, I actually still haven't worked it out exactly, but they, they migrate south down a different route to where they migrate north again. And But like a lot of Australian birds that are boom and bust, you'll get seasons where you'll get lots of rufous song larks coming in. Some years you, you hardly get any. Um, and and when, often when you get rufous song larks in, you, in big numbers, you might get things like white-browed and masked wood swallows in big numbers. And even things like budgies coming down after after boom years. But the really interesting thing about central Victoria, and, and also this would be the central west of New South Wales, and even the south coast and mid-north of New South Wales, is you also get winter migrants. You get birds that are altitudinal migrants, not just birds coming from Tasmania, like the yellow-tipped form of striated pardal oat and, and the grey fantails. That's a fascinating one. Certainly down here in Melbourne is we get two different populations of grey fantails. We get the more greyish ones, paler ones, uh, with a less strong black barring. Um, they're, they're the ones that breed here. But it, this time of year, most of the grey fantails here are a bit more boldly coloured, often have a cinnamonish colour to the belly, but even if they don't, they still have a thicker black chest band and thicker, more contrasty uh, black and white around the head. They're the Tasmanian fantails moving through. Places like central Victoria, as I said, you get, especially in places where you get box iron bark or spotted gum forests in flower, you'll get movements of birds like white naked and yellow faced honey eaters, uh, eastern spinebills, golden whistlers, birds coming down from the higher country. But you also get other birds moving in, um, more woodland birds, like you'll get noisy fryer birds coming down in winter, whereas normally they'd be further north in summer. So you get this great mix of birds. It's um, living on the inland side of the divide is is one of, as a birder, it's one of the most rewarding places, particularly in autumn and winter, uh, because there's so much going on. Yes, it's always something to learn. Absolutely. Um, there's been a couple of questions that have been really interesting that just I just want to finish up with. Um, I know we've just ticked over eight o'clock, so hopefully people can stick with us if you can. Um, so on that note of migratory, um, so this might this is up that alley. Uh, Rosalind says they live in southern Tasmania. They only see robins in the winter. So where are they going in the summer? Ah, so if you're seeing robins in winter, they're going up. They must be going up into altitude, uh, mm -hmm. higher up into the mountains. Certainly, a lot of the robins, uh, particularly flame robin, uh, definitely high altitude breeders in most cases. Uh, both on the mainland and in Tasmania, uh, but also pink robin uh, tends to be a, a breeding in the mountain, in the fern gullies and things like that, Off, sometimes right down to the coast, but they're very much in that sort of rainforesty habitat and they will move out in into more open uh, woodland heathy areas, uh, particularly the brown birds, the female and young male birds. So, And scarlet robin is a bit 
similar, not quite as pronounced as Blame Robin in their movements, but that's definitely what will be going. If you're seeing them in winter, it's probably they come down from the denser, taller forests. Great. Um, just before we get to, I think, the last question, I've got one that I can answer. Um, so Charlotte asked how you manage with glasses and binoculars. And ah. you'll see, I wrote in there, you'll see that your binoculars should have like a rubber end or in my case, a twist top. And so if you can retract them and they then sit the lens straight on your glasses, you don't need to then worry about going up and down and making yourself dizzy and potentially dropping your glasses. That's how I do it. It took me a while to get used to it. <laughs> yeah, it was the same. I, like, like I got glasses about five years ago and for the first few months I was just constantly taking them off but it, it's so you, you get used to it and it's much much better okay so I think we will finish up with this question I've just got to find it again has Sean ever seen a night parrot and what have you still got left to see in terms of your Australian birds Sean right well I was going to give you a I sort of thought I was running out of time. I was going to give you another demonstration of my um, of my non-artistic artistic technique for recording birds. This was my bird list tonight, and I saw this strange parrot. I don't know if you can see that it, out, out in the backyard. And so that's what I would do if I did see a night parrot. But no, I haven't seen a night parrot. I have tried to look a couple of times when I've been in range basically anywhere in the outback where there's spin effects driving along with the uh, outback roads with the hand out the window freezing holding the spotlight as you're trying to um, see if you can see one by the side of the road but no um, I have very few Australian breeding birds left to see uh, it's the night parrot the buff-breasted button quail which is it, who knows it's so hard to locate we don't even know if it's it may even be extinct and we're not sure uh i haven't seen princess parrot and i have uh and also black grass ring because i couldn't get in uh, i went into suboptimal areas for them and i've never seen carpentarian grass ring which is um which, which i've tried for a couple of times and any others that i haven't seen uh recent splits that um that I had never seen that subspecies so it's a matter of I'll have to go back last year I did an outback trip and managed to see four new birds three of them were actually just subspecies that I previously missed like the the western grass wren or chef or the copperback quail thrush so um which have been split since the last time I was there yeah so there's not that many there's a few seabirds left and lots of vagrants um, Bronwyn's just snuck in with, have you seen a grey falcon, Sean? Ah, uh, yes. For those who've read The Big Twitch, they'd know that that was my nemesis bird. I think I had 12 sites that were recommended to me where it was cursed. Somebody said, oh, they're dead certs at this site. And, of course, oh, I went there and yeah. never saw them. Um, so I began to believe they didn't exist. But I actually did see a grey falcon on my outback trip last year, after, again, after three three attempts. It's sites that were, um, they're, they're actually easier to see now because we know more about them, but also they've taken to nesting in communications towers in the outback. So that's how you find them. You just look for big towers in the middle of nowhere. And I'd been given the location of three towers where they were nesting. Uh, and as it turned out, this mythical bird, the first tower I was given was a mythical tower. It didn't exist at the site that I was given. And we drove past the actual tower. And by the time we realised our error and came back, the birds were flying off directly into the sun and we couldn't see them properly to count as grey falcons. So, But luckily uh, in Western Queensland, I managed to finally, finally see a, a grey falcon and they are brilliant birds. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, look, I think we could go on and on for another hour, but we probably shouldn't. We probably should let everybody get on with the rest of their evening. Um, thank you so much for joining us, everybody. 
Um, a massive apology to people who popped in late because I worked out that when Eventbrite sent the waitlist emails, messages out to people, it didn't include the Zoom link and I wasn't aware. So thank you for people who to bear with me rep replying to everybody's frantic emails. Um, I hope you all enjoyed the night. I hope you've learned a lot. Um, stay tuned. I've recorded the session. And so in a um, couple of days, once we get it all downloaded and then popped up onto YouTube, we'll send an email out to everybody with the link so you can watch it again. Please share it with your family and friends. We need to convert some more bird nerds. Um, so I hope you all have fun on your next burning adventure, whether it's in your garden or out on a trip. Um, and stay tuned for our next Birds Meet webinar um, in just a few short weeks. There will be details coming soon. Thanks very much, everybody. Enjoy the rest of your night. And a huge thank you to Sean for sharing his wonderful knowledge with us. Thanks, Sean. Oh, thanks, Holly. Thanks for, for all that you do and doing these things. And, and thank you, everyone, for coming out tonight, out to your computer screens. <laughs> <laughs> Bye, everyone. See you later. Keep on twitching. <laughs>